Hello um, and good afternoon, at least where I am. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to this event uh, brought to you by the California Series in Public Anthropology and hosted by the Watson Institute of International and Public Affairs. My name is Yevo Yusunite. I am Associate Professor of International Security and Anthropology at Brown University. And I'm also the editor of the California series on public anthropology. I will be the host of our conversation today uh, about writing books that reach both scholarly and broader audiences. And it is a delight to talk about these matters with three of my dearest colleagues, allies, and friends. So let me introduce them. Keith Marshall is an editor uh, at the University of California Press, where she has been acquiring books since 2008. She manages anthropology, food studies, and Latin American studies lists. And before we embarked on this journey of editing the California series of public anthropology, she also published both of my books. Mm -hmm. Lawrence Ralph is Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Center on Transnational Policing at Princeton University. His scholarship examines how police abuse and mass incarceration affect the lives of Black urban residents and foregrounds their experiences of violence, injury, and disability. He's the author of two books published by the University of Chicago Press. The first one, Renegade Dreams, Living Through Injury in Gangland, Chicago, came out in 2014 and received the Wright Mills Award from the Society for the Study of Social Problems. His new book, The Torture Letters, Reckoning with Police Violence, came out last year and has received rave reviews from the broader public. It has been covered in all the major literary uh, newspapers such as New York Review of Books, Chicago Review of Books, Boston Review, you name it, and received enthusiastic endorsement from fellow scholars. Henry Louis Gates wrote, devastatingly powerful, the torture letters is one of those extraordinary volumes whose contents are accessible to all readers. It is a necessary and important book that measures both the economic and more importantly, human cost of police violence. The book is accompanied by a film that Lawrence directed for the New York Times Obdoc series. I've had the pleasure of being Lawrence's colleague when we were both at Harvard, and it is an honor to continue working with him as the advisory board member for the California series in public anthropology. Uh, and Jason De Leon is professor of anthropology and Chicana Chicano studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. He's also the executive director of Undocumented Migration Project, which is a long-term anthropological study of clandestine migration between Latin America and the United States that uses a combination of ethnographic, visual, archeological, and forensic approaches to understand this violent social process. Jason is the author of The Land of Open Graves, Living and Dying on the Migrant Trail, which was published by the University of California Press in 2015. It received multiple awards, among them uh, the Staley Book Prize from School for Advanced Research and the Margaret, Margaret Mead Award from the American Anthropological Association jointly awarded with Society for Applied Anthropology to books that broaden the impact of anthropology by presenting anthropological data in ways that are meaningful to wider publics. A graphic review of the book appeared in the New York Times. Jason is also the recipient of the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, more commonly known as the Genius Grant. And he's the head curator of Hostile Terrain 94 exhibition, which is a participatory art project that's taking place through installations uh, around the world. His second book, Soldiers and Kings, is under contract with Viking Press. On a side note, Jason is also the one who first showed me the way to Erivaca, and I don't know whether I would have written Threshold if it hadn't been for his encouragement and support along the way. So 
Thank you all for agreeing to take part in this conversation and welcome to everyone uh, who is attending this webinar or watching the live broadcast wherever you are in the world. We will begin, I, will, I have some questions uh, that I will ask our guests and we will then open the floor to and take questions from the audience. So you can use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the screen to type in your questions while we are speaking and we will get to them uh, later. Okay, so the, the first question I have is for both of you, Jason and Lawrence, and that is how, how did you start writing for broader publics, for people who are not necessarily your peers or your students, people not in academia? Was there a moment that made you realize that that's what you want to do or that's what you need to do? Or was it a more gradual process of becoming a public writer? So Lawrence, in your new book, The Torture Letters, you explain that after talking to Chicago residents about police torture, you could not help but think long and hard about these residents' concerns and that you did not want what they told you to just be beneficial to other scholars who theorize torture for living. In order to speak to multiple audiences, you decided to write the book as a series of open letters and Chicago Review of Books described the torture letters as lyrical and poignant. And Daniel Allen called it one of the most profound and luminous books I have read in years in any genre. But even your first monograph, Renegade Dreams, which was a more traditional scholarly ethnography, um, reached audiences beyond academia, whether you intended it or not. And then Jason, in your case, uh, your book, The Land of Open Graves, received numerous accolades and has been described as remarkable, powerful, invaluable, and impressive feat of scholarship that deserves a broad audience and Stanley Brandis wrote, this book sears itself into your memory. You literally can't put it down. I read one uh, interview where you said that it really didn't make sense if the only place people could see this work was in academic journals, but you also acknowledged that um, it hadn't been your plan all along, that when you began studying undocumented migration, you didn't set out with the goal of writing for the public at large. It is quite hard to believe this considering what broad impact your book and related projects, multiple exhibits, the documentary uh, Border South have had because you've made now anthropology both relevant and even urgent and cool. Um, so yeah, what have been your trajectories of becoming public scholars? Yeah, I can begin. Um, I think for me, it it's still grounded in uh, ethnographic questions and um, experiences doing field work. And so, for my first book, I I uh, I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to write for the public, but I knew that there were already a lot of people working in the space on the same problems that I was interested in. And so one of the first things that I do when I approach a, a field site is to think through, like, what are people already doing to address that social problem? And that social problem in my case was gang violence. And so there's a lot of churches working on that issue. There's nonprofits in the space. There's the criminal justice system, juvenile detention centers, jails, prisons. Uh, there's the gang itself. Uh, there's community residents and block clubs. And so I started out just as an ethnographer trying to uh, grapple with how to make what each of these groups purported as solutions, how to make that legible to each other. And so in, in grappling with that problem, uh, and speaking between various organizations and, and trying to figure out like what each one is leaving out of the picture, um, it, it, it became a way for me to, to write more accessibly. And, and so 
for for the problem of gang violence, that's how I approached it as as a way, like as an intermediary, I feel like. Uh, for the torture letters, it was a bit different because when I approached that problem of like how to write about torture and and how to talk about police violence, when I asked residents, um, you know, who do you want this work to address? You know, who do you feel like needs to hear your story? They didn't say scholars, you know, they, you know, and, you know, that might seem like common sense, but when I did the work on gang violence, when I asked the same question, people did say scholars. They said, you know, every time you write about this community, people write about it this way and they write about us as dysfunctional. When you write it, you know, you need to show this and that and this. But in this case about police violence and police torture in particular, that, that wasn't the picture. The picture was, uh, you know, activists, you know, write to the activist community, tell them to keep going, write to police departments and, and, and try to figure out how they allow this to happen, write to politicians. And so I took that seriously. And, and so I was trying to find a method and a way to write that, that uh, you know, honored what my interlocutors were telling me in the field. And that's how the idea for a series of letters emerged. Um, first off, it's just great to see the four of you, um, and I hope you are all doing well and, and healthy, and I'm sad that we can't do this in person, but I'm happy to be here with you uh, today. And, um, you know, I, Lawrence has, I think, was much, his, his approach to this was much more thought out than mine was. Mine just kind of happened on accident. Um, and... And I actually thank Kate uh, quite a bit for helping me to think through the the writing process. Um, you know, when I began working on on Land of Open Graves, I initially had no plans even to write a book. Um, I had come out of the discipline of archaeology, and I I just thought that for for tenure I would write ten articles or whatever the requirement was going to be, whatever hidden metric that they say there's no metric, but there actually is a metric. Um, and so when someone said, "Okay, you've got to write a book," and then I was like, "Well, shit." I've hated writing as an academic for my entire career. Um, and that just sounds like like a horrible process. Um, and so when I started working on it, um, I realized that the only way I was gonna finish the book was, was two things. One, I needed to be as true as I could to the people who were in the book. And I wanted to tell their stories in as plain and as accessible a way because the stories had impacted me so much and I did not want to sanitize them or um, overthink them to the point where they just kind of lost all of the emotional umph to it. Um, but then the other part was, I knew that I had to find a writing style that I felt passionate about, which had never been something that I was excited about as an academic. I had loved writing before I went to graduate school. I had loved literature um, and graduate school, of course, beat those two things out of me to where I just now learned to write in this kind of awkward, inaccessible way. And so I started working on Land of Open Graves and I remember sending uh, Kate, the like, uh, early parts of, a, of the first draft and she said something like there's moments in the book that I really like they're sort of lively I feel like I'm there with you um, you know your voice is really working and there's other parts where you just sound like a professor and it's terrible and it's not good and it's really boring and it's killing this whole story and so and I knew that was the case um, and so I had to go back in and try to figure out how could I massage these pieces that I knew were important these analytical pieces with the um, my kind of emotional commitment to to people and, and to the writing style uh but i really don't think i don't think that that book would be what it what it is if i hadn't had her holding my hand through through so many parts of that because i really was figuring it out um kind of on on the fly and it wasn't until the book was done that i kind of realized what had actually happened and then also um it really just confirmed my commitment to writing and then after that there was kind of no looking back like now i, I found that there was this new approach that i could embrace um that felt really good. And finally, I was in love with writing again. Um, and then after that, I, I just never wanted to look back. Um, but a lot of it was, you know, my, my clumsy attempts to kind of two, diff two different things, put them together, and then, you know, seeing what, what worked and what didn't work. Well, that's so interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the word, Kate, in, in just a second. I, um, you know, hearing you both talk, it, it seems that a lot of the like writing for the public comes both um, trying to honor what people we work with 
want and maybe writing in a style that feels honest to them, that does justice to their stories and also working with, uh, with good editors. And when I, when I reflect on my own um, trajectory, it's very clear to me that when I wrote my first book, I, I, I knew how to write for broader audiences because I had been a journalist but I wrote the first book because I was an autopilot. I knew I had to do it because I was on tenure track and you do write the book because you need to get tenure. And two, I wanted some kind of tangible object material to give back to the people who gave me their stories, even though they, I was not sure they would read it and they didn't, I wanted to show them like, I took it seriously, look here, I wrote this. And it was very, very different with the second book when I felt both the urge to write and the urge to, to publish. And political realities, I think, added pressure to it, of course. In, and I wanted to write not just for academic peers, of course, I wanted them to read it, but I, I wanted to write for everyone who was participating in these public debates about building the wall. Um, and I wanted it to be read both by emergency responders and anthropologists alike, as well as friends who had nothing in common with, with either group. And I think Kate's advice was crucial for me along the way too, um, especially helping me to be comfortable with putting um, myself into the book, which was I was very uncomfortable with and I hesitated. Um, and she she helped me to to write as both an anthropologist and a first responder, which I think helped. So that brings me to, um, to the question uh, for you, Kate, uh, and in your role as, as an editor for anthropology and Latin American studies, um, you've acquired and edited books that are both academic as well as crossover or academic trade so when you talk to, or when you work with prospective authors, either at the stage where they just pitch you the idea or they look at, at you, they already have a prospectus. So when you look at the manuscript, what is in there that tells you that it has the potential to reach outside of academia? What, what would be, that it would be appealing to broaden? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I would say that, um, I would start by saying that the vast majority of books I publish are works of scholarship that are primarily read by students and scholars. And some of them sell really well because they're used in the classroom, but they're not necessarily reaching that crossover audience. But, um, you know, publishers, um, uh, booksellers, and especially in the university press world, we talk a lot about crossover books. Um, so, um, and these categories that are sometimes described as academic trade or trade. Um, and these tend to be books where the topic, um, you know, just speaks to a contemporary political moment or a major trend in public discourse, um, or perhaps they're book authored by uh, people who have large public platforms. So that could be um, a self-generated public platform on social media, but it might also be an author's affiliation with an institution. So for example, Jason was, I had this affiliation with um, National Geographic, which was very useful for me when I was pitching the book to my marketing colleagues, because we were fairly certain that National Geographic would do something related to his book, as long as it wasn't written like a conventional monograph. Um, and again, that's not knocking conventional monographs, which are, you know, the heart of the field. Um, but, you know, I think the key things that I'm looking for as an editor, um, for anthropology, a big one is accessibility of the writing. Um, you know, I, uh, you are in a field that um, sometimes um, the theoretical writing can be so dense that um, you are really only speaking to other anthropologists. And that isn't a problem as long as you're conscious and aware of who you are communicating to as an author. So anytime an anthropologist wants to write for that broader audience, um, the quality of the writing deeply matters. And of course, you ethnographers are masterful storytellers, you know, have deep, deep, insightful, thoughtful things about the communities that they write about. But, um, but sometimes that can be 
lost um, in uh, in sort of like matching the conventions of the field. So, I mean, I I like to tease Jason about this all the time, but he the first time when we very early on, he was talking about his book. He was like, my book is about necropolitics and necropolitics this. And I, I like, I, I had only acquired a few anthropology books and I was like, what is necropolitics? Like I had to get out a dic dictionary and I was like, I thought your book is about people dying on the border, you know? And like, so, um, you know, and I think it's really like meeting with that, um, with that original story and that political urgency. Um, uh, is it, are sort of key things that I'm looking for when I'm evaluating whether or not I think a book has the potential to cross over. Um, thank you. And you know, even putting together this conversation made me made me reflect on what you know what I think uh, when we are considering books for especially for the California series and public anthropology, like what. Um, what works, like what criteria do manuscripts have to meet? And I think for me, like there are two that seem to be very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and one, it has to be well-written. So I, I hear what you are saying with minimal jargon and theory. It's not, it's not that theory can't be there, but it, like, it, sh it has to be used sparingly um, only when necessary and not to demonstrate an author's erudition. Uh, and really the focus is on storytelling or ethnography as storytelling. And second is that it has to say something about issues that are at the center of public debate. So it could be migration, affordable housing, um, education, environmental pollution, or it could be matters that are always already relevant to people. So um, like how do we deal with end of life care or with, with death? So authors, I think authors can make readers care about a lot of issues if they really want and if they put that work in actually making those connections and showing um, showing why it's relevant and revising the manuscript, especially when it's based on a dissertation. Um, and and I would say that again, echoing what what you said, Kate, that. It's really, I think it really, it's about what matters to the author and what the author wants to do with the book and what, what they want the book to do. Who is it written for and wh why is this book? Uh, and that's a difficult question, especially for junior scholars because we, um, we, we went it both ways. We want the book to be for our colleagues who will evaluate us for, our scholarly uh, competence, uh, and we want it for 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 others. And it's not to having it both ways is not as easy as it sounds. So I want to go back to uh, to ask you, uh, Jason and Lawrence, what have been maybe the the more difficult or the most difficult parts of writing public scholarship? Uh, did you encounter? any obstacles, whether they were internal, such as not necessarily knowing how to uh, write for non-academic audiences, or whether those were external, um, such as institutional hurdles or pushback from senior colleagues. And how have you negotiated your positions as both academic anthropologists and public scholars? Um, sorry, I've got a small person in here doing various things. Um, hey, close the door, please. Um, you know, I think for me, we talk about public anthropology now um, in this, I think, relatively positive way. That's not always been the case. Um, I think when I began this work uh, and people would use the word, would use phrases like public anthropology in reference to what I was doing, it wasn't in a good way. It was a slight. It was, you know, public anthropology means a theoretical means you're dumbing it down. And I think that one of the things that the Trump administration has done for us is to remind people that we need experts who are accessible, because if not, the information that gets put out into the world is by a bunch of clowns. Um, and uh, so I do think that uh, we are in a better place for that now. Um, there was a lot of pushback, I think, when I when I was writing the book from 
from colleagues, from in, institutional sorts of forces, where people were worried I wasn't going to get tenure, that I wasn't going to be um, intelligible to a, a review committee. And, um, you know, I got, I've, I like academia because I can do whatever I want, but I hate most of it most of the time. Um, the structures, the forces, the the pressure to do certain kinds of things to reproduce itself. And so I was just like, whatever, it's fine. I want to do this book. This is the book I feel passionate about. If, if I get tenure, that's wonderful. If not, you know, I can look for another job. But I, I did not want to spend all this time working with these people who I was really committed to and then produce something on the other end that I did, that I felt was disingenuous. And luckily, it, you know, things, things worked out. Um, and I think for me now, sort of post tenure, I think one of my jobs is to not reproduce the system, but to find ways to rep to, to provide an example for other ways of doing it. And to also to help my junior colleagues feel comfortable, um, to, to feel comfortable, you know, doing um, things that aren't necessarily um, tra tra traditional. And so it's, um, it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge, I think. I mean, although now, you know, with, with tenure, I can do whatever I want most of the, for the most part. And I don't really think anymore about the evaluations of, of like my colleagues. Um, I, th I think at least not with the book that I'm writing right now. I mean, I, I could care less about, uh, you know, it's, I'm writing for a public audience because I think that um, there's enough stuff, in, you know, theoretically heavy stuff that you can read on these issues um, that people can, can access through journal articles and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I'm writing about issues that I think that the general public needs to, needs to know more about. And so I've just kind of, I don't even think about the, the academy at the moment, but that's like the, the benefit of and the privilege that comes with, with tenure. But I do think it's, it's very difficult for, for junior scholars right now to think about this because people right now, I think, understand that they want to be accessible and they want to be read and the work is so important that it should be, but they are up against, you know, people who are reviewing them who aren't into those issues or who maybe are anti being accessible because they can't do it themselves or just because they, they don't see value in it. Um, so I, I do think it is a, it is a struggle that that most folks are, um, are currently really dealing with. Yeah, I would I would echo a lot of what Jason just said. I think I think the one of the major challenges is that uh, we're not trained to write accessibly. We're not trained to write at all, really. You know, uh, we're not trained to write inaccessibly either. It's just just that that's what we read uh, when we're in grad school, and so you know we have to teach ourselves how to write, and um, that becomes an extra challenge, an extra burden because you you still have to do everything else that you have to do, and then on top of that, you have to figure out a way to. Uh, write accessibly and so it, it's a constant for me writing is a constant um you know education it's a constant re-education that has to do with like reading a lot and it also has to do with reading about writing and it has to do with uh you know sometimes taking classes that have to do with writing but um you know i think the end goal is to be able to for me uh, is to be able to translate experience better. And so uh, what I like about uh, Jason's work, Abe's work is that, you know, I think great ethnography, it matches the ethnographic context. And it's, it's almost like a mirror of that ethnographic context. And so part of what makes the, the estrangement between theory and the ethnographic vignette so stark is that all of a sudden you're outside of that ethnographic context and you're in another world of, uh, you're in a classroom or something, right? Um, uh, and you've been transported and it's jarring and it, it doesn't feel good. And so, you know, we have the ability to, to experience a lot of things that people don't get to experience and uh we have to find some way to to reflect that and uh for me each project then presents its own challenges because now you're in a new ethnographic moment and you have to find a new way to translate it so it, you know even if something that you've learned in terms of the accessibility of writing worked in a particular context for a particular set of questions 
that doesn't mean that it'll work again in the same way for the next project and, and the next set of questions. And so that's the kind of re-education. And so for me, when I was writing about torture, um, I was encountering the phenomenon that Jason was mentioning in which um, to write about it theoretically uh, sanitizes it, but then to try to write about it in a way that is felt and experienced can sensationalize it. And so therefore, how do you mediate that? You know, how do you do that without reproducing the spectacle of the thing? And uh, again, for me, the, what it came down to was thinking very intentionally about audience and who I was writing to at any given moment, what I felt like they needed to know what they knew already. And I think this is a, a kind of hidden part of the ethnographic that oftentimes we don't discuss in terms of writing. It's like, uh, who, who are we writing to? Why do they need to know this thing? How are we in a position to artic articulate something from a unique vantage point that can have a pointed intervention? And maybe all of it can't be done in a book. Like maybe some of it has to be done in a podcast, you know, in an exhibit in another medium, because, uh, you know, it's that precise sometimes about who we want to re reach and why uh, through, through what we're studying. You know, I just want to add, um, I think one of the things that I love about, about Lawrence's work, um, especially, you know, the, the two books sort of back to back, I mean, it, it very much reminds me of someone like Neil Young in that you have these records that come in a sequence that don't, that they build from the, what came before it, but they're also radically different from that in, in these really kind of creative ways. And I think that, um, that that's also really exciting in terms of thinking about public writing is that, um, you know, there is no formula for this. And when we try to follow these formulas, it, you know, you can, you can really see it clearly that like, you know, this is just, someone's just, is trying to plug this in, they think because they think this is what public writing looks like. But you know, the 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 fact that every project is different and requires a different kind of way of thinking, um, we never hear that, right? We're, we're told like ethnography. This is how you write ethnography. People tell you that, you know, and you're and so you know, as a student, we write that down and go, okay, I'm going to go and do this, and you know, it's all going to read like uh, Argonauts of the Western Pacific kind of thing. But clearly not. I mean, every project. Um, throughout your career, I mean, as I'm working on a, a on a new project right now, it's a radically different project from the previous one and requires different kinds of, of thinking and writing about it. And I feel like we need to have that conversation early on with, with young writers to say, there's no one size fits all. Um, you need to understand what's come before and all these different kinds of approaches, but then you need to figure out what is best for the, for what you want to say in the, in the world and to be okay with, you know, with, with that experimentation and for thinking about, you know, you, you don't have to keep repeating yourself and actually you shouldn't, you should be trying to grow in, um, and, and push it in, in new directions, which is what I think Lawrence has done really amazingly. I just want to make a plug because I uh, uh, mentioned this, but I, one thing as an editor that I'm constantly imploring authors to do when you want to reach a broader public is to, you know, or even just revise a dissertation is to spend a lot of time reading books that you love, that um, books that um, impacted you, read fiction, <laughs> read creative nonfiction, because I think, again, just graduate school doesn't train you necessarily to write at the level that uh, of where you want to be if the goal is to reach that audience but beyond um, other anthropologists. Um, and actually, I wanted to ask you, Kate, from, again, from your perspective as an editor, what, in addition to writing clearly, what have been perhaps some of the difficulties that you encounter when working with academic authors who want to write public scholarship? Do you need to encourage them to be more creative or are they already very creative when they come in and you need to like help them find the form of the book? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, it's hard because there, so there, it's a different, it's a combination of factors that publishers are considering when they're thinking about, is this book a crossover book, right? And of course, I just, with the caveat that not all public 
anthropology necessarily means you're writing an academic trade or a trade book, but um, you know, so it's the quality of the writing, um, accessibility of the language, it's the clear, uh, an author who can articulate a clear original art argument. Um, and then also it's just like identifying books that um, resonate with whatever the, the popular conversation is, which of course, you know, which means many different things, but um, you know, I, in just listening to you guys talk, I was, I was thinking about how, um, uh, Jason, do you recall, like, so Jason won um, the, the AAA's North American Anthropology Best Book Prize that he shared that year with Dr. Amy Cox, and, and I, there was just this, like, the best new scholarship this year is all North American-based scholarship, and to me, as an editor, that was just kind of, like, interesting to sort of hear, uh, was something I had not encountered or considered, um, because of course, US-based projects are much more likely to have that crossover audience, right? And actually one of the impediments that a lot of anthropologists face in terms of, um, you know, uh, can, in terms of pitching their book as a crossover is just that um, there may not be like a widespread audience um, in the US, uh, which is the primary book buying public that any US publisher is um, pitching to. Um, and so that, you know, that's a real, Challenge. So some of it's, it's just like, what is the topic? Does the topic map to and um, fit into the kind of thing that uh, publishers they, is going to be able to get media attention around, even if it's kind of a niche and specific, I'm not necessarily talking about like book be reviewed in the New York Times, but you know, is it going to be picked up on major blogs or outlets? So for example, in the food world, is this the kind of book that's going to be reviewed in civil eats or discussed by food writers is um, um, that kind of thing, if that makes sense. Those are the, the key things that I'm looking for. And I see we, we have more and more questions coming in. So we will start answering them in just a minute. I want to, to ask one last question um, while I have the opportunity. Um, and that is what, like if you could give very concise tips, what would be those more important pieces of advice for academic anthropologists, whether they're junior or senior, who are considering writing a scholarly book that they want to, to reach the public at large? What would be your like several either do's or don'ts? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, you know, Jason was talking about his story. I think it's very, uh, sounds very familiar in terms of, uh, like when I was in grad school, uh, I I was told not to to write about the public and and or not to even do work in the U.S. necessarily. Um, as an anthropologist. And I think, you know, writing is similar to like the field work experience when like you have those moments where like something doesn't feel right, right? In the field, like oftentimes that's the moment that's ethnographically significant. It's like, you wouldn't be feeling that way if, uh, you know, you if you were feeling fine all the time, then you need to question like what you're taking for granted. So like the moment that you're feeling like something's wrong, usually that's the moment you need to pay attention and figure out why you're feeling that way. And I think oftentimes writing, you know, people feel like that. People feel like something's wrong. They can't figure it out. Like it, there's a hurdle they can't cross. And so they, they, you know, retreat into the familiar or retreat into um, the expectation. And usually that's the moment where you, you should push yourself and figure out like what is unique about what you're trying to say that is going against the grain in a very productive way, actually. Like that's the moment you need to bear down and figure out like, what is a, what it what is it about that precise conundrum that others around you take for granted or that you're you're having struggle with and and that could be the heart of um, 
the way that you translate that to the public. And so I think that just learning how to be comfortable with that uncomfortability, I think that that is something that's key for, for a writer. I, you know, I would, I completely agree. Um, <clears throat> and I would just add like some, some basic things too. Um, read, 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 read. And, I, and by, by read, not ethnographies, actually read good things. I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, get out of your, I mean, I think just embracing other types of writing, literary nonfiction, fiction, screenplay, whatever it is, but I think, you know, poetry, I think exposing yourself to good writing um, is really crucial. And for me, like 80% of my writing is laying in bed reading when I'm, when I can't get through a sentence. Um, I just find that really, really helps. Um, it also, you know, sets a good example for me. Also it gives me inspiration for, for ways to experiment. Um, you know, and maybe one other thing is you, I think for me, academic writing is, is easy and in many ways lazy because I can hide behind words. I can, um, I can kind of cloud the narrative with, um, with jargon and, you know, and that's, I, that's kind of, I would go to that if I was getting frustrated, like, oh, I can at least say this, I can rattle that off in, in a page, that's, but, but to actually put down a, a paragraph that every single word matters, every single word, um, you know, serves a, a, a crucial um, purpose, that's really hard. And um, I think you have to embrace, I think um, public writing, at least for me, is is a very difficult thing and it's a slog. It's, every, it's a day in, day out kind of slog and it's a different kind of labor than, than I was used to with academic writing. And I've just, for me, embracing that pain and suffering of writing um, um, is, is important. And because I think it's, uh, to go to the other stuff, which you know you can uh, you can revert to the kind of traditional academic writing, which I think we we we've, we've been trained to do, and it's oftentimes much easier than than a well a well put together kind of sentence. Um, I think you have to move away from that and really commit to um, to thinking about it, the the role of of, of every single word, um, which no one. I mean, I never got any writing advice as a as a graduate student other than you know my, my advisor. His advice was don't use compound sentences because you tend to put too many ideas in one sentence, but that was it. Um, I wish someone had said to me, be kind to your reader. Think about who's gonna read this and are they gonna wanna keep going? Um, and you know, like as Lawrence was saying, taking classes, studying up, you know, studying how to write, I think can be really, um, really, really helpful. Um, and that's, a, that's something that most, most of us have never done. Um, we think that we're an, these experts. We're an expert in academic writing, and then now moving into the public writing requires a lot, of, a lot of work. And so I think you have to, um, you know, em embrace that. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that I think that sometimes um, people truly bury the lead or are afraid to state the obvious. And so someone might have a book or a topic that I think has a possible non-academic audience, and but there's this total reluctance to um, just kind of say what the problem at the heart of the book is um, because it, it just feels like it's like, well, of course people are suffering. Of course there's inequality. Of course um, things are wrong with the world. But it's like, you, you really need to just, right? And, and say what is motivating you to do this work and also acknowledging your own relationship to it. I do think um, many crossover books, the author is a really significant part of the story. And and that's not to say you have to write something that's super solipsistic and focused on your experience in the field, but um, you know it it mattered to me deeply that Yeva is a paramedic <laughs> because it informs the way she did research, um, and um, you know, and and I think again, like I, th these are just ways that I think sometimes people are trained to sort of undersell themselves and sort of the ideas and 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 um, really spelling out why their books matter. So, and I will just um, conclude with a with a formula that I um, probably repeat something that that you already said. So I, I would say read, write, and do something else besides reading and writing. So I agree that reading good books is very important, but I also think that we should read. Like reading bad books helps too, because that's how you recognize what you don't want to 
copy and reproduce and make make you like recognize what works and doesn't what you like what you don't uh, write yes writing should be a daily practice it's um, it's not easy but it's very rewarding and then do something else besides reading and writing which you know it could be exhibits it could be filmmaking it could be like any kind of public um, work but do something outside of just being the reader and the writer, uh, make music, whatever it is that you want to uh, make besides that. Okay, so we have about 15 minutes now for um, questions from the audience and we have quite a, um, um, a few of the questions. I, um, um, I think we can we can start with a with one that that I already see a couple of people repeated. So both um, Anna Vasilache asks: Should public should writing public anthropology become a trend in a good way, and what is needed to do that? And somewhat similarly, and more com complexly, perhaps Nancy Khalil uh, expressed a concern that there is this this sort of uh, polarization between work that's academic and work that is public and perhaps we are recreating this binary by saying that you know these are like despite or resisting academic expectations so uh how does one how does work like lawrence's and jason's become the norm instead of our framing it as marginal to it um what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, um, I think it, 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 it has to do with how we also talk about the stakes of our research and the stakes of our projects, right? And so, uh, and being, I think being clear, uh, about our our audience and, and and their different expectations, and what I mean is that, like for when I was writing the torture letters, like where the field is in its conceptualized conceptualization of torture is very different from what I was experiencing in the field, right? And so um, there's all this you know literature about evidence and witnessing, and you know. That can get very complicated and, and esoteric, but when I was doing the research, you know, I ha felt kept having the need to explain that, uh, you know, I believe that no one ever deserves to be tortured, no matter what they've done, right? And that was seemingly a simple thing, but I think as Kate said, like that was something that I was taking for granted, and that if I was writing an academic article I wouldn't feel the need to say but yet when I was gauging where the field was where my interlocutors was where I kept having to assert this because they kept showing me that they didn't think that that was true so um so then the premise that no one should ever be tortured became the 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 heart of the book where for an academic audience, it, it wasn't. But I think in explaining the, that complicated terrain, it is of interest to other theorists and, and the way and the assumptions that we take and the, and the need for ethnography and the role of ethnography and the importance of ethnography for what we take for granted. So I think that um, the questions are right in the sense that there isn't necessarily this stark divide where it's either or. But um, I think that, you know, why writing for a wider public means that we're, uh, it's almost, I think as Jason was explaining, it can be harder in a way because you're writing for the least common denominator in a way, like you're writing in a way that everybody can understand. And I think that's the difference, you know, rather than taking for granted that some people already know Way, and some people are already on board with where you are in terms of your argument. And, you know, just to follow up, I, I, I do think, you know, 
we have created this this binary between and I, and I always say you know people call me say I'm a public anthropologist and then I always want to ask them like what it is that they do um, you know what is the opposite of a public anthropology and I think when you frame it like that um, it doesn't sound very good right like I do I do private anthropology or I do this like inaccessible kind of anthropology I think if, when we if we can start to have those kind of conversations um, I think that's a way to to think about it less as a as as this kind of binary and more you know to to put the academy on um, on notice that we are living in a world where uh, the status quo is I think is not sustainable um, and we started to have these conversations you know a decade ago in terms of funding when you know an NSF asks for broader impacts and that used to just be some boilerplate thing that you would put in there and and with the the, the tightening of those purse strings. Uh, you know, NSF now takes a lot more seriously this issue of broader impacts. And I think in general, we as a discipline, we need to be asking scholars like, why is this important? How are people gonna understand? If it is so important, why is it sequestered here, uh, you know, in the academy? And I think that's gonna come, have to come from all of us um, because I think that everybody in some way, shape or form can do better to, um, to make their, their work more accessible. And I think those who don't wanna do that, we should ask them then, well, why are you even doing it? Why are you are you trying to be inaccessible? Why are you trying to you know, um, if you're committed to the creation of knowledge, why are you making this knowledge so difficult um, uh, to get at? And I think perhaps that's a way to start um, uh, having these conversations beyond these these sort of simplistic um, binaries. Uh, but that's a that's a that's a long term project and it's a lot of work. But I am hopeful, and I you know I think that we have seen over the last five to ten years that the discipline is moving in this new direction, and books are coming out, and people are producing scholarship that is. Um, more understandable, more relevant, um, and also maybe just better at at storytelling. I mean, because there's, there's even things, I mean, there are things that I'm interested in, anthropologically speaking, but I can't get through the books because they're so dense or because they're just, you know, they're not, um, they're not working hard to uh, explain these ideas to someone who is not, you know, living immediately kind of in that, in that research sphere. And so I, I think we all need to do better on that. Um, and we need to encourage our students to be thinking about these things or, um, from the very beginning and, and setting this kind of example of, you know, the public stuff shouldn't be tacked on at the end. Um, if you are committed to doing public anthropology, it should be something that is built into to the, the ground floor of the work that you're doing. And, you know, that's something that I, I work with my graduate students now. Um, it's things that I, I try to do in terms of mentorship with, with junior scholars um, and junior colleagues. Uh, but that's a, you know, something that we, we have to do in, in a bunch of different ways. And the public work doesn't have to be the book. That's the other thing that I would just throw, you know, like not everyone I think has to turn their monograph into something that is for general audiences. I mean, but yet you can successfully successfully be a person who uses the toolkit or expertise or knowledge to pitch up eds, you know, speak publicly. You know, I, I just, I think that, um, you know, the, this conversation is about writing books for the public, but I do think um, that's, that that is a, a skill set that not everyone has or not everyone has is in a position where for um, professional reasons they they can write that book um, that they want to or uh, so I, I do think like we can think more broadly about how to translate the key ideas and interventions of anthropology for um, as broad an audience as possible. Well you know and just to add like you know we're starting the universities are now requiring people to write these these DEI statements and um, and I think, and they're taking them, you know, I think a lot of places are taking them seriously. I think we need to do the same thing about, um, you know, accessibility of the work. And like, as you said, it doesn't have to be the, the book, but, you know, what are the ways in which you are trying to disseminate your scholarship um, to, to, uh, to a general public? One of the questions was, do you think um, there's a space for public anthropology and journal articles? And I do think the answer is yes, depending on where you're placing the, um, the article, right? So, it could be an op-ed, it could be something in a venue like Sapiens, right? Or, or other um, outlets that are speaking. Um, the conversation is a big place where I discover scholars and authors and people are translating big ideas from their books for um, a broader public. The conversation gets syndicated and picked up by me other media outlets. So I, I do think, yes, journal, journal write, article writing um, can be a space for some of that work. Katie, you were going to answer this question about the review process for crossover books. 
So peer review is the same. I often will let a reviewer know if I think a book, um, it, who I think the audience for the book is and our um, form, um, you know, asks for the author to weigh in. Um, it's almost never an issue for academic trade books. For commercial trade books, sometimes there is pushback where you get um, peer reviewers who will say, this book is wonderful and I, I don't recommend advising it, but it has no theory, you know? And so like, I see that kind of frequently. So, so sometimes what I would do in those situations is I would, um, I might tap a, a professional writer and not an anthropologist to be a second or third peer reviewer. And I imagine it's more or less the same at other presses. Okay, thank you. Um, there are some questions about writing. Um, I'll, I'll specifically um, cite the question from Jana Steinova uh, to all the participants. How do you decide to what degree to write yourself into your project, especially when your background is different from the context that you are studying? Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I think what's helping, what helps me is to think through long-term commitments and like what I want to do as a, as an intervention in the field of anthropology throughout my work. And, you know, one thing that I, I think is important is to, uh, really critically engage with the notion of expertise and like who is the expert and you know the role that communities play in solving their own problems and so these are kind of long-term issues that i i grapple with and so um it, it informs the when i show up and where i show up in the text and and oftentimes when i show up it's to like subvert this idea that the anthropologist has all the knowledge or something like that. So I'm like talking about the ways that people are make funny, making fun of me in the field or talking about what I don't know and why I don't know it or talking about, um, you know, when people, um, you know, raise, raise questions about my authority or expertise for, for various reasons. So I think that again is connected to one's argument and to what uh, what you ultimately want to say. And the last thing I'll say about that is that oftentimes the reason why we don't show up is because of this fiction of objectivity, this idea that, you know, we're om almost like um, omnipotent and we know all and we can just sit back and observe and explain. Uh, and so what is that distance doing? I think oftentimes that distance is masking a, like a, a fear of vulnerability. Like you don't want to be vulnerable as an author. You don't, you're worried about, you have an anxiety about not feeling like, or, or showing that you're not smart, or you have the anxiety about um, not showing that you mastered this uh, field or is a question of authority. And so, you know, I think we have to constantly ask ourselves, why don't we feel comfortable um, uh, showing up? If, if in fact we were collecting the data, we were there all the time, you know, what are the moments where we want to hide? What are the moments where we feel comfortable showing up? And I think oftentimes for me, I, I invert those moments where, uh, I, the, where I, I I feel like most anthropologists would recede. Those are precisely the moments where I make myself present in order to um, kind of uh, switch uh, the the trope of the the expert in the field. I hundred percent agree. Um, you know, I show up in my writing when when I'm the most nervous, stressed out, when I've screwed something up. Um, when I'm working through an issue and I don't know the answer, I want people to know that I'm struggling with these things. Cause I, you know, and part of that was my reaction to reading ethnographies, especially ethnographies about communities of color written by, by basically white people 
who would come across as these, you know, experts or the kind of voice of God explaining kind of what's going on. And my question would always be, well, do people like you? Are you awkward in the situation? Are you like, how come you never seem to fuck up? Because I, I fuck up all the time and, I, and you, you're, you've got it all kind of figured out. Um, and, you know, in the very beginning, I was very nervous about representing other people. Um, even if they, even if you know, we might have come from similar backgrounds or had had some things in common, I was still sitting from this place of privilege, and felt awkward about that, and wanted my that awkwardness to be there so that the reader could know that what you're learning about is not just someone else's experience, but you're learning about someone else's experience is mediated through our my experience with them and through the things that I that I'm witnessing, and it's important for you to understand that you're getting it all filtered through me, and and I don't have it I don't have it figured out. Um, but I also think about my role as um, the occasional narrator or the, the person who brings context or analysis to explain something that might seem foreign um, or seemingly shocking and I want to make it make it more make it more familiar. Um, and I think a way to think about this is and this is helpful for me is to think about okay, here's my narrative. These are my characters what role do I play in each of these sections? What what role does my character play in part one, part two, part three? And um, why am I present and why am, and why am I not present? Um, and so, you know, cause I think it, it can be easy to either remove yourself completely from this whole situation or to center it so much on you that you lose sight of everything else. And I think we have to be very judicious about when, when, to, when to show up. And I, I think having a good editor can help you and good first readers to help you think through those things and, and figure out when to pull out of the narrative and when to, um, you know, to, to be more present during, during particular moments. Yeah, there are a lot of authors who I'm frequently having to tell them, like, it's too centered on you, like it's too much about you, right? Um, so, yeah, so I feel like I put my foot in my mouth because I said that I'm not, I often ask, but, you know, when you are relevant to pushing the story forward and explaining some sort of interaction or connection, um, you know, that, that then matters. Okay, so we are um, running out of time. We're actually over time, but there are so many terrific questions. So I will, I will read you two or three more questions and you can choose if one of them sparks any ideas and you can answer them and we'll, uh, we'll, um, we'll end after that. So one question is from Ariel Grushko, which I think is very important. And that's, do you have any advice for those of us working outside the US, how to basically how to make, you know, US audiences interested in, in things that are happening outside of the US? Say hi. Um, the other question is how should anthropology graduate students in the early years begin to incorporate public writing in their projects? And the third one is, what if we research things that we do not agree on, uh, we are not engaged in? How does public anthropology and writing publicly should, could look like um, when you're working with groups that, that whose practices you are not advocating for? So any, any thoughts on any of these issues? Um, yeah, I, I just start with the last question. I mean, I think that, you know, writing about power is, is a big, is a big, um, there's a, a need for that in public anthropology. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I've encountered this in my work on policing in the US. And I think oftentimes, um, the role I think when we when we think about um, field work and we think about data, I, I think we often fit, think about um, just observing what's there and 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 taking stock of what's there and acquiring knowledge about uh, particular situations. But oftentimes when we're writing about structures of inequality and we're writing about power, uh, we have to write through silences and redactions and the way that power protects itself from accountability. And I think that explaining those processes uh, 
is is a um, a, a major aim of public anthropology, at least in, in my opinion. I think that you know, as people working in a professional space, oftentimes we get access to power and we're able to mediate problems in a way that uh, the people suffering from those structures cannot. And, and so I think that, you know, part of, part of writing it is that translational capacity where you're putting people in conversation with each other that wouldn't necessarily be in, in conversation with each other. And you're, you're um, kind of, um, you know, rewriting the silences of the past and you're kind of, uh, you're, you're articulating things that are often unsaid. And I, and I think that that's a, a, a big role of, uh, of public anthropology. And again, I think part of what we've continued to say uh, throughout this webinar is that, you know, it can be in multiple forms. And I think that when we think about writing, oftentimes we're taught, it's almost like a scarcity model. It's like, if we're doing it in the dissertation or doing it in the book, it's taking it, or, and we're doing it somewhere else, it's like taking away from the scholarship. But oftentimes it's actually additive, you know, like these other conversations, these other audiences add to your, to your understanding of the problem, they add to uh, the, your accessibility, they add to your own uh, platform and your ability to speak on the issue. And so, uh, you know, writing about powerful can uh, afford, I think, new possibilities for a public anthropology. And it is also like um, a, a short follow-up. I think it is not the same to, like the way I see it, public anthropology is not the same as activist anthropology or anthropology of advocacy. So when we are working with um, communities or people who, for example, now I'm, I'm, I'm working on a project on gun violence and work with, with violence workers. Um, it's, you're still writing for the public because you want people to understand the, the social situation and, and show people's experiences through storytelling. It doesn't mean that you are advocating on their behalf in any way or form. It's, I, I feel these, these are two, um, two different uh, intentions. Any, any more comments or reflections um, on either advice for graduate students or for scholars who are working on non-US based topics as we close? I would just say that there's nothing wrong with working on a non-US topic. And of course, most anthropology is not US based. So, um, you know, and I, again, like just I, I wanted to loop back and say that um, I think I think something is uh, you can be writing for you can do public anthropology without be without writing a book for a commercial audience or a general audience. Um, I think, for example, there's a book that I did recently that's about maternal Adrian Strong. It's about um, documenting death, about maternal mor mortality in Tanzania. There's definitely an audience for that book outside of anthropology, right? People who are concerned with um, international health policy, um, you know, actual practitioners and women's health care. Um, and we made a case that that book really needed to publish open access, right? Because there was this audience beyond. So I don't, I don't think that that's that's an example of where that book is really significant and important for a lot of people thinking through. Um, uh, things related to birth practices and maternal mortality is a persistent problem um, with, but it's not about reaching a general audience. So I, I guess this, what I'm trying to say is that this, the purpose of this workshop was, was to focus a little bit on that translational scholarship, academic trade, but that I, I don't think that means that that's the only form of 
um, public or applied anthropology um, out there. So don't don't despair. So. And California Serious in Public Anthropology has published books that are based on other uh, other parts of the world. So as long as those topics are relevant to anyone uh, and not like really narrowly regionally focused. Um, Jason, do we have you back? I'm back. Sorry. Um, do you have any concluding thoughts? Yes, I would. Um, you know, we had those, those three questions that were posed to us. Um, the first one was, how do we think of, how do we increase interest in work that happens outside of the US? And uh, simply, I would say, good stories are good stories, regardless of where they happen. And so um, if you are committed to narrative that will shine through regardless of the, ge of the geographic location and, and editors know that, they, it, they, they see it quickly um, and, and readers know that. How do grad students incorporate public writing early in their career? Just, I don't think you have to think about it in public writing. I think you just have to be committed to being a better writer, not a better academic writer, but a better writer in general. Um, and then finally, you know, how do we write about things that we don't necessarily agree with? I think many of us work around issues that we that we find difficult or disagreeable, or you know, or we're trying to alleviate or raise awareness about. And I think that, you know, at least from my own perspective, you know, when I write about things that are difficult, including right now writing about about um, human smuggling, I'm not writing about it because I agree with it. I'm writing about it because I want people to understand how it works. And my commitment in that writing is not to, I want to give smugglers a kind of fair treatment. It's more that I want the people that I work with who happen to be smugglers, I want to be able to, to do right by them writing wise. And by that, I mean, giving you as full of a picture as I can about the good, the bad and the ugly um, in, in, in pursuit of, I would hope a, a compelling story so that you'll want to learn more about these issues. Thank you very much to all of you. We are really out of time. Like this hour flew by so quickly, um, engaging in this great conversation. We have a ton of other questions that I hope we will have other opportunities to address. Um, and I want to thank Ellen um, again for hosting this webinar through the Watson Institute and to the panelists for taking your time to engage in the conversation and answer the questions. And on that note, I hope to see you live next time. Oh, miss everybody. <laughs> Can't wait to see you in the future. Good luck writing.